We now come to chapter four of uh, the book, Beyond Innocence and Redemption, Confronting the Holocaust and Israeli Power, Creating a Moral Future for the Jewish People. And this conversation is, uh, is about the uh, shared history uh, of the uh, Jewish and Palestinian people uh, toward an inclusive uh, liturgy of destruction. Um, hello, Professor Ellis. Hello, Professor Coy. Okay, so uh, this is a um, another uh, uh, intense chapter. Uh, the title of this chapter is Toward an Inclusive Liturgy of uh, Destruction. And um, uh, so uh, chapter three, the last, uh, uh, last chapter uh, was about Jewish responses to the Palestinian uprising and the challenge of uh, Jewish descent during this time as a way of seeing the uprising in its uh, historical perspective and uh, to see the continuation of Palestinian suffering rather than something new and unprecedented. And we look at the, the importance of these histories uh, in, in terms of uh, undermining the themes of innocence and redemption central to Holocaust theology. But we also said that, and uh, I think we ended with some of your afterthoughts about Jewish descent uh, and the, the uh, in a way, the loss or removal of the Jewish particularity. Okay, so uh, chapter four uh, is about the, the liturgy of destruction. And you uh, uh, began by uh, a discussion on the book of David Roski's Against the Apocalypse, Responses to Catastrophe, in modern Jewish culture. And you here you talk about the Jewish responses to destruction using ancient archetypes like the burning of the temple, the death of the martyr and the pogrom. And uh, this is a, 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 a way of uh, using memory as a form of persistence. And that is the refusal to cut oneself off from one's people while at the same time speaking to the world in cries of anger. So uh, let me get back to you, Professor Ellis. Could, could, you, uh, could you tell us how you, you uh, uh, stumbled into uh, David Roski's uh, uh, liturgy of destruction? Well, I don't remember how I, I stumbled into it, but I had the book and several of his books and they're fascinating books. Uh, they're very deep books about uh, how Jews have responded to catastrophe after catastrophe after catastrophe uh, as a form of uh, resistance to catastrophe or to what those who did things terrible to us wanted, that is for Jews to disappear or to be subjected to them uh, and uh, Roski's goes through a, a Jewish history of using these terrible events as a way of crystallizing why to remain Jewish instead of to give up. Uh, and this is memory as resistance and often it was, became part of what he calls the Jewish liturgy of destruction that they're not really, they're not linear stories of our destruction. Uh, they become uh, archetypes. Uh, it seems to happen over and over and over again to Jews. Uh, and Jews represent it over and over and over again as a way to continue on and to say to hell with you, but also as a hope that it will be overcome and one day there will be no more suffering. A very deep uh, rendering of, uh, of a history, this is Jewish history, and others' his histories do this as well in their own way, but there's a very particular Jewish sense that goes way back to the Bible, 
the destruction of the temple and the exile and after that to the destruction of this and that in Spain. And so every time Jews thought they had it made, something happened that was uh, a catastrophe. But these artists and these writers, these texts, uh, remembered it. This was very important to remember it, not to say it didn't happen or let's put it in the past. Jews kept bringing it back as a memory that needs to be retold and retold and retold, not as a way to say, don't do it, uh, don't continue on, but to continue on and also to present it ultimately to the world and say, this is what you've done. Here we are. We continue on. So very deep uh, about this Jewish drama, this Jewish liturgy of destruction, you think you have a Jewish liturgy of affirmation, but it is an affirmation within destruction. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, reading of Jewish history. Uh, well, this is uh, not, uh, you didn't mention this in your book, but uh, I, I, I'm just reminded because I just, uh, I, I just watched Zoom. I, uh, I attended the Zoom uh, meeting a presentation by uh, uh, Professor uh, Barry Lang. And he talks about the lacrimose uh, reading of Jewish history. Is this uh, the same or there's a difference? I, I, I'm, I know you also have uh, uh, mentioned uh, uh, Professor Lang's uh, work in, in one of your books, not, not in Beyond History and Redemption. Yeah, well, there's a, a debate within Jewish life, of course, in Jewish history, were Jews always victims? And the lachrymose sense of history is to say, listen, don't think that Jews were always innocent and Jews were always victims. Their Jewish history is complex, as certainly it is. But the liturgy of destruction, I don't think fits in there because these were real events which then become represented uh, in a broad sense and remembered, even in liturgy. Um, and I would say there, uh, so there's a, there's a sense that, and even beyond innocence redemption, people have said, well, Jews aren't always innocent. In our suffering, we were innocent. That doesn't mean all Jews were great, that there was no sinfulness or no this or that. That's not our point. What happened to the people uh, wasn't deserved. And, uh, but what Jews did was present these events even beyond what they were. We kept them in our memory and that could lead us to just think we're always victims, that's possible. But remembering uh, is also a form of resistance. Uh, but again, as with any memory, even resistance, the question is what's included and what isn't. That's, that's right, and I think that's the point of your uh, uh, using uh, uh, Roski's uh, 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 Liturgy of Destruction. Okay, uh, let me go back to it again. Tell more about this, uh, this uh, Bitburg affair. Well, the Bitburg uh, Cemetery uh, was uh, in Germany, uh, and there was uh, Pre President Reagan was going there and was going to attend a ceremony. But in that uh, graveyard were also uh, Nazi soldiers and some high-ranking soldiers, and uh, the question became a big public uh, spectacle almost where in the end Wiesel gave a lecture which was carried on national TV with Ronald Reagan sitting there by him and Wiesel saying to Reagan, this is not your place. You should not go to a cemetery that honors the dead, the German dead in World War II and especially with Nazis uh, buried there as well. Uh, Reagan went but uh, Greenberg also, and there was a big book that I came across, which had these addresses. And here was an example of, you know, when Wiesel spoke or wrote, 
this was part of the liturgy of destruction. If you listen to him, it's not a linear history. It's not a history as we would learn it today. Uh, it's part of the liturgy of destruction. But now we're in the modern period where Israel is empowered and Jews are empowered. And yet Fizel and Greenberg are remaining in some ways back in the past. But it also showed that you could have a nationally televised uh, event with Ronald, with Elie Wiesel, a professor and a writer and a Holocaust survivor, first and foremost, lecturing the president of the United States. It showed how far Jews had become empowered, but Wiesel wasn't recognizing our empowerment. He was still talking about our victimhood. And then another element is naivete about Ronald Reagan. Maybe uh, Ronald Reagan uh, should have gone because maybe he, it was a proper place for him. Uh, so there is no critical understanding of US foreign policy or US domestic policy in Wiesel's talk. Uh, it's like we're back in uh, the Holocaust, but in fact, we're not. The Germans aren't and Jews aren't. And whether there should have been this ceremony at all, that's another point. And whether the president should have been there is another point. And whether Wiesel should have lectured uh, the president, that's another point. But it's a fascinating uh, confluence of history and the present. And it shows how Wiesel is kind of bringing us back, bringing us back as victims when we are no longer victims. And Germany, that does want to repent for its past, mostly in my view, so it can be powerful in the present, they want to leave it behind. Many Jews want to leave it behind. Bissell says that if we leave it behind, we will not remember the lessons of the Holocaust. And then the question was and is, what are those lessons now? And what is resistance the memory as resistance now, not then, that's another question now. And uh, Rabbi Irving. Okay, and then uh, you mentioned about uh, some messianic uh, expectation that was uh, uh, in a way coming out of this uh, uh, liturgy of uh, destruction. And uh, you mentioned two books. Uh, one is by Janet Aviad, Return to Judaism, Religious Renewal in Israel, and another by Ian Lustig on Jewish Fundamentalism in Israel, For the Land and the Lord. And you talk about these two uh, movements. There is, an, uh, um, in, there is a, uh, a religious renewal. This is in, in Israel, what's happening in Israel. There was a religious renewal. Uh, Jews returning to the land of Israel. And there was also a return of the secular Jews to Orthodox and Neo-Orthodox Judaism. But then there's also the revival of Jewish religious fundamentalism. What, what, is, the, what is the significance of these uh, two movements uh, in relation to the, the liturgy of destruction, which is now, as you said, uh, now being done in an empowered Israel? Yes, you know, Holocaust theology was a way of reaffirming Jewish identity through the memory of the Holocaust as present, but we had become empowered. And uh, after the 67 war, uh, Israel started settling areas of Jerusalem, East Jerusalem and the West Bank and some in Gaza where there were religious shrines and a religious events that had happened uh, in the Bible and elsewhere, or at least were, were thought to have happened there. Uh, and there was uh, a renewal of uh, religiosity among Jews in Israel, both secular Jews becoming more religious in general, and then uh, Jewish fundamentalism, which had essentially been unknown or little known in Jewish history. There were times, of course, but here we had the land itself and the occupation within the occupation, the new occupation or the further occupation of Palestinian land. You had this uh, Jewish settler movement 
which was somewhat secular, but also very religious, that were making demands on the Israeli government and the liberal or even conservative Israeli governments who weren't necessarily religious were using this to justify the occupation. So we have Holocaust theology not recognizing the empowerment of Israel in its writings, really, except for Irving Greenberg in a way. Uh, we have increasing settlers and settlements, and it's clear now that the occupation of East Jerusalem, the West Bank especially, are really going to become more and more. There were many Jews who thought after the 67 war that the lands that Israel conquered would be given back and there would be a peace treaty and we would start anew. But in fact, the government and these uh, religious renewal folks, many of them Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox, uh, were going to settle wanted to settle and were demanding to settle permanently in Palestinian areas. So we have a lot going on uh, in the United States too, and in Israel after the 67 war that Holocaust theology didn't anticipate and was using Holocaust theology and the liturgy of destruction and the Bible and everything to make these settlers and settlements quasi-permanent or permanent. And uh, the idea too, within the governmental structure was that if they got enough settlers in East Jerusalem and the West Bank, that could mean permanence for an expansion of the state of Israel. Uh, so now there, were, now there were religious reasons given mm -hmm. for the, the, the original settlers uh, in Palestine that became Israel were most of them secular. Their reasons were Jews needed a place of empowerment and they weren't going to find it in Europe. But more and more as time went on, especially after the 67 war, there were overt religious reasons given and the government, which was largely secular and these religious settlers came together to do what both of them wanted sometimes independent of each other, but they did it together. Mm -hmm. uh, how different are, are, is this uh, you know, returning to the land of Israel? Uh, because I, I think we remember, uh, I, I remember our discussion about, you know, uh, American Jews uh, going to Israel as, uh, uh, as a, uh, trying to reconnect with their uh, Jewish identity. And uh, um, so some making a, uh, I think that, I think when I was in Israel, in Israel they were using the word Aliyah. Uh, yeah. So uh, what's the difference between those Jews seeking their Jewish identity in relation to the land and this, you know, uh, this uh, movements of renewal and including this uh, fundamentalism? Well, for Palestinians, it may have been no difference. But for the Jews themselves, there was a big difference. Uh, there were Jews who came to Palestine from the, the, the late 1800s, 1900s, for all sorts of reasons, and during and after the Nazi period. And then after the 67 war, there was a wave of Jewish renewal, Jewish identity and Jewish pride, some of which brought maybe some American Jews for sure to Israel, but most of them were sort of secular in a Jewish way. Some of them became religious, but they might've been religious in a liberal way. The settlers, and they could be seen as settlers, depending on uh, who you are. Palestinians could see all of this as a, a series of settlers, but then became the definition of those who went for Jewish identity purposes. They wanted Israel, but the settlers after the 67 war, the religious settlers were very different and often there were tremendous clashes between the two. So Palestinians could see both as settlers, but Jews who were secular might be somewhat religious and the Orthodox and the neo-Orthodox settlers these were considered by Jews to be very different. There, 
So there were unintended consequences of Holocaust theology and the 1967 war that needed then to be controlled within Jewish life and ultimately was managed by some for their own reasons, but was also very difficult to control. No one had predicted the, settle, the second, what we might call the second settler movement after the 1967 war. Uh, and it created uh, a great division within Israel and of course among American Jews. Uh, that was became part of the American, uh, the, the American Jewish Civil War and the Israeli Jewish Civil War, which continues to this day. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I guess for the, that's right. Uh, there, there are differences uh, among Jews, but for Palestinians, it may be just, you know, it's, it's difficult to distinguish uh, who is a unintended settler and those who have uh, yeah. deliberately. Palestinians, it was different uh, also, even though it could be seen as the same, because these new settlers were so vehement and so angry and so violent. Now, the first settlers were also violent, but usually, in my experience, Palestinians differentiated between uh, the settlers who came for Jewish identity, even though that hurt them, and this new wave of fundamentalist settlers who you couldn't encounter and argue with and bond with in any way. There, there was no movement. They were taking new land mm -hmm. that was beyond the state of Israel. And uh, they were also uh, in many ways uh, disgusting. In other words, it's very hard to differentiate between Jews who take somebody's land in a certain way yeah. and Jews who take someone's land in another way. But there were distinctions made, although in the end, it spelled doom, both of them, for Palestinians. It, it must be difficult for a, a Jew of conscience to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, living in a place that has been, uh, you know, you, uh, that has been uh, taken away from the Palestinians. Well, more and more it became difficult. In the beginning, people said, well, we needed this. Look at our experience in Europe. Uh, we don't really recognize what happened to you, or if you did, uh, let's do something about it in the end. But uh, as time went on and the settler movement expanded and expanded and expanded, more and more of these Jews who originally came to Israel for other reasons, Jewish, let's say Jewish identity reasons, uh, some of them gave up on the idea of a Jewish state and recognized that they had participated also in something that was wrong. This goes, this is not 1990 so much, although we went through the different Jewish resistance movements last time and people were beginning, uh, some Jews were beginning to say, you know what, I'm here. My parents came here or my grandparents came here, but we recognize that what my family and our families did to you was wrong. And they recognized it by other Jews doing the same thing. Yeah, so it's, it's a fascinating uh, internal discussion among Jews, even Zionists. And that's a whole nother book about what happens within an empowered Zionism that wants everything as opposed to those Zionists who wanted to be empowered, but recognized Palestinian rights and therefore a Palestinian state. In the end, many of these Jews uh, left Israel and are leaving Israel uh, and their descent has grown over the years as they've begun to understand even their own involvement. Yes, okay, uh, let's uh, move on, uh, Professor Ellis. And uh, so you, uh, you said that this liturgy of destruction is, was now at the service of power. And, and let me read uh, uh, this uh, 
text from your book. The liturgy of destruction with its elements of remembrance and the messianic is now in the service of power rather than a precarious survival. Thus it is met with an evident boredom. The need for constant rehearsal seems more and more to pervade the contemporary liturgy of destruction. For many, the liturgy of destruction rung, rings hollow. It does not acknowledge those who have suffered and are suffering today because of the liturgy, the Palestinian people, and reveals a hollowness, almost a deceptive quality that forces a re-evaluation of the liturgy itself. A new inclusiveness in the landscape of the dead and dying is called for if the voices of the Holocaust are to be rescued from an artificial construct that threatens memory much more than the Bitburg affair did. So here, yeah, well, the, the uh, yeah, yes, Professor Ellis. Yeah, this is the crux of it all, isn't it? Uh, we Jews remember our destruction and properly so as a form of resistance. And some in Roski's books, uh, the way he relates it is just unbelievably heartrending and beautiful, uh, haunting. And I was very, very taken by it. But now this is for Jews without power. That's when memory is a form of resistance. But now we have power and we've created other victims. We can't keep replaying our liturgy of destruction as if we had not embarked on a planned and systematic road of destroying others. Once you start destroying others, but you want to keep your liturgy as it was, then that's about keeping memory as power over against others. So the inclusive liturgy of destruction means that as we remember the times we suffered, yes, yes, now we need to remember the times we have caused others to suffer. And this is maybe the most controversial aspect of my book. And I remember uh, meeting Roski's uh, in my trip to Auschwitz in 1992, which was quite an event and became my next book titled Ending Auschwitz, uh, The Future of Jewish and Christian Life. Not ending Auschwitz, the memory of, but ending Auschwitz, the memory of our suffering as if we are not causing suffering to others. And I was in Warsaw before we went to Auschwitz. We were there early and Roskies was there. And I went around with him to a few of the cemeteries where Jews were buried. And uh, he made it very clear that he thought my sense, taking his work, the Liturgy of Destruction, which I took very seriously, and now applying it as an inclusive Liturgy of Destruction was to him reprehensible. What the... Uh, what, uh, what was reprehensible to it, at least from his view? Uh, that's another clue to the power of this book and this narrative and the resistance to it. If Jews admit that we have suffered, but now we are causing suffering to others, well, then Jewish identity is different and the liturgy of destruction is different. Uh, but for those Jews, including uh, many of them on this trip to Auschwitz, uh, which was a group of Jewish scholars and rabbis, it was uh, Jewish intellectuals and rabbis, I think it was billed that as, uh, you could see among many of the Jews there, not all, a disdain for Palestinians. Roski is one of them. I mean, the idea that we would remember what we did to others especially Palestinians. That was an idea that uh, sullied the memory of Jewish victimhood. But my point was we're sullying that memory by causing the suffering of others. If you don't want our memory to be sullied, don't oppress others. So it was not greeted. Uh, I was uh, ostracized by most of them. 
uh, and Roski's too, because he was using the Holocaust, again, rendered hauntingly and beautifully as a safe place to ev evade what we were doing. Now, Auschwitz was a memory for us, but Auschwitz was being mobilized to oppress others. That was unacceptable to say as a Jew, and especially to include Arabs and Palestinians. Again, we get into this question, uh, you can define it in whatever way you want, but really a racism, such an undeserving population who can't think ethically, these backward Arabs, this, this is the kind of language you would hear, it, sometimes overt and between the lines. And you're going to include them and we have to include them? Well, if you oppress them, the answer is yes and tough. So the inclusive liturgy of destruction seems pretty obvious. And if you've noticed in these writings of mine, mostly I take what has been said and thought and taken it to the next step. Holocaust theology said never again to the Jewish people, and I agree with that, and also in the beginning, never again to any other people, which I agree with. And then we have what's happening to others at our hands. So what's the next step? What's the next question? And the Liturgy of Destruction, again, very haunting. Well, what's the next step? It's not creating, I'm not creating new ideas in a sense. I'm taking these ideas and these very deep understandings to their logical conclusion. Never again to us, but should we embark on anything resembling that to others? If we do, include them in our liturgy of destruction because they have a right to their own liturgy and once we do that to them, it becomes part of our life too. We can't say that's not part of our life. It's just like Christianity. Christians want uh, a pure Christianity. They wanna get away from their history. And Jews said correctly, no way. You're not getting away from us. What you did to us, you need to repent for. True enough, I'm very strong on that. But what about our repentance? What about our inclusion? of those we have caused to suffer. And it's ongoing. As we're at Auschwitz and I'm discussing Wierowski's, who's, who's really upset with me, he thinks I'm beyond salvation. Meanwhile, Palestinians are being dragged out of their homes. Palestinians are being shot. Palestinians' land is being taken. Meanwhile, as we're speaking, as we're remembering Auschwitz, this isn't a past event that we need to include. It's happening now. This is 1992. It's happening now. This is uh, the trip to Auschwitz. It's, it's not a... So you, you, you think, what is a guy like him who is so bright and writes so beautifully and has researched so much, what is it that I can see that he can't what is his blindness? What is my sight? It's not about intelligence and it's not about research. The memory of the liturgy of destruction that Roski's writes so beautifully about blinded him to what we're doing. And he's afraid, probably to this day, that if he opened his eyes, he would realize that we had, in the oppression of the Palestinian people, we were trivializing our own liturgy of destruction and that it could never be the way it was. It had to become inclusive and it had to include those he didn't want to see. He didn't think deserved to be part of it. Tough. Well, it, it might be like, <laughs> You know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, you, you, once you know about what's happening to the Palestinians, then 
it, it's as you said, it's uh, it's uh, that's the end of uh, Jewish innocence. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, it, it must be a very uh, it's a bitter pill to swallow. Um, and when also, he, he might not you... have uh, uh, he might not have seen the un unintended consequence of his book. <laughs> The unintended consequences of Holocaust theology, the unintended consequences of his own writing, The Liturgy of Destruction. Yeah. Well, Jews, it's all unintended for Jews. We didn't realize it. We didn't want it. But we've done it. You know, people say, they used to say to me when I lectured, are you saying that Jews are torturing others? That can't be. I could give you many examples. That, that can't be, Jews don't do that. Well, I didn't believe Jews did it either. Tough. Jews are doing it, period. So this is not my writing, my narrative. It's not hypothetical. Like, if we oppress another people, our liturgy of destruction will change. That's a hypothesis. If, if we did it, we've done it. This is not theory. We've done it. So if we recall our history in the same way we did before we did it, this oppression, then we're deceiving ourselves, we're deceiving others. It becomes a vast hypocrisy, not because our suffering wasn't real, not because that liturgy, liturgy isn't haunting and beautiful in its own way and a form of resistance, but because it has changed. It's already changed. The inclusive liturgy of destruction has already arrived. Yeah, and it's not just the you know these uh, atrocities that were happening during the Palestinian uprising, as we discussed last time. Uh, you know the Israeli historians like Shahak and uh, Ilan Pape and Benny Morris, they are all which we're going to uh, in, in a moment. Uh, they they were saying that you know uh, this was this has been happening since the since the creation yeah. of the state of Israel in nineteen totally from Holocaust theology it's sort of like Christians if I might who uh, celebrate uh, Catholics for instance celebrating Mass as if nothing has happened in history Catholic history against others you know if you go to a Catholic Mass which is quite beautiful and that's a liturgy of destruction isn't it. It's a beautiful liturgy of destruction. But in that liturgy of destruction, you don't have the native peoples and you don't have the Jews who are being massacred and who are being killed and whose lands being, you don't have any of that. You get off scot-free. But anyone who's standing there, and I'll give you an example. Once I was at uh, an Anglican service, I'd been invited to speak <laughs> and a woman, a priest, woman priest, I uh, was doing the mass and I was sitting there, you know, just as I was invited. So I was just sitting there and she told me later that she was so nervous that I was there. And I said, why? I was just sitting there because you're a Jew. And she was realizing as she was saying the mass, what Christians had done to Jews when these masses were being said. I made her uncomfortable because I were not because I was grimacing or yelling at her, but because she was recalling what Christianity had done to Jews. And then she was asking herself as she was celebrating the mass, how can I do this in front of a Jew? Well, if you can't do it in front of a Jew, you can't do it. Isn't that the point? And so when I had Palestinians to my home and it was a Shabbat, I would not do the Shabbat prayers in front of them, even when they asked me to. What does that mean to them? And these Jewish high holy days, like Passover, now I'm yelling, as my kid said, Dad, Dad you're yelling. Okay, this, this is very important. How can yeah, we talk that, about the Holocaust? That's why, that's why I think yeah, you have to, to speak very strongly because, <laughs> yeah, you really need to, you know, uh, 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 sort of put it in their uh, into their faces. Well, it is in our faces. 
We, you don't have to put it there. It's there. But we just try yeah, to override. But there's, but there's the a power. kind of blindness, as you said. Yeah, the power of the liturgy is trying to overcome it. And so Holocaust remembrance, which becomes so hollow, becomes more and more forced as people, Jews and others, learn more about what's happening to Palestinians. So it becomes, instead of this deep appreciation of Jewish history, it becomes a form of hypocrisy. Yeah. I think the one of the very important uh, insight and a, ch a challenge uh, for, this, uh, for uh, this inclusive liturgy of destruction uh, well, it's, uh, for Christians, once we do this, we might never have to do our, any of our religious <laughs> well, that's, well, of our religious services. Because well, that's if you have all the victims uh, uh, in, in front of you while doing all the, your religious uh, uh, rituals and uh, rites, and you know how those... Um, those rites and rituals have been used. Uh, Christianity has another part to it. Many of the people going to the mass have been conquered by Christianity. So you have in the Philippines, for instance, every Christian there and say the Catholics has been conquered by the Christianity that is being celebrated. So you have a whole... <laughs> Another issue, and uh, you, you would say, well, you shouldn't be able to have a Catholic mass without all the victims of Catholic history being there. And the answer is, they're already there. What do you do with that? Now, that's a different question than, uh, than the Jewish liturgy of destruction. But we might say that Jews shouldn't celebrate Jewish high holy days or the Sabbath without Palestinians being there. And answering to what we have done and what we're doing. Now, you might say then, well, Mark, that's impossible. You're asking me to give up my religion. Or with Catholics, you're asking us to give up. Uh, tough. Figure it out. Get with it. Stand up. Find out if it's possible. And if it's not possible, it isn't. If it is possible, what is that possibility? My point is inclusive liturgy of destruction. If we can't do it, then shelve the liturgy of destruction. If we can't expand it, it's over. And that's what many people have been saying for years about Holocaust remembrance. Unless you're going to fess up to what you're doing now, I'm out. I can't do it anymore. Yeah, that, that's really thinking the unthinkable <laughs> as, uh, okay, Professor Ellis, let's uh, look at the possibility of an inclusive liturgy of uh, destruction and uh, uh, stories that are, I, I will have to say that's uh, very difficult to read. Uh, uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's almost unspeakable. Okay, so, um, but uh, we have to speak. Let's, uh, let's start with uh, the stories of, uh, well, you said that uh, though it goes unmentioned and often repressed today with the founding of the state of Israel, Jews for the first time began to see the suffering of another people, the Palestinian Arabs, in light of the suffering of the Jewish people. Here is the liturgy of destruction in its intuitive and more inclusive sense, which seems closer to reality than the stage and inclusive one heard today. And here, I, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, a, a quote from Benny Morris's The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem, where he was talking about an Israeli, the story of an Israeli intelligence officer, Shimaria she Gutman was involved in the occupation of Lida. And this is, um, this is uh, what he said in that book. All the Israelis who witnessed the events agreed that the exodus under a hot July sun was an extended episode of suffering for the refugees, especially from Lida. 
Some were stripped by soldiers of their valuables as they left town or at checkpoints along the way. Gutman, uh, Gutman uh, subsequently described the trek of the Lida refugees. A multitude of inhabitants walked one after another. Women walked burdened with packages and socks on their heads. Mothers dragged children after them. Occasionally, warning shots were heard. Occasionally, you encountered the piercing look from one of the youngsters in the column, and the look said, we have not surrendered. We shall return to fight you. For Goodman, an archaeologist, the spectacle conjured up the memory of the exile of Israel at the end of the Second Commonwealth at the Roman hands. And here uh, is another uh, a story from uh, uh, Morris's book. And this is actually what uh, Simha Kaplan wrote of the occupation of the Palestinian village at the Wayima near Hebron, which had surrendered without the fight. And, uh, and I read, the first wave of conquerors killed about 80 to 100 male Arabs women and children. The children they killed by breaking their heads with sticks. There was not a house without dead, wrote Kaplan. Kaplan's uh, informant who arrived immediately afterwards in the second wave reported that the Arab men and women who remained were then closed off in the houses without food and water. Sappers arrived at, to blow up the houses one commander ordered the sapper to put two old women in a certain house and to blow up the house with them. The sapper refused. The commander then ordered his men to put in the old women and the evil deed was done. One soldier boasted that he had raped and then shot her. One woman with a newborn baby in her arms was employed to clean the, court the courtyard where the soldiers ate. She worked a day or two. In the end, they shot her and her baby. This is really, you know, I mean, uh, I, I imagine uh, the first time you read this or others would have heard this. I mean, that's it's really unthinkable for Jews to be doing this. That's what I thought, of course, and many Jews thought it. But these new historians, writing at the best, about the same time that I st started a Jewish theology of liberation, were recalling a history, often in the Israeli archives, by the way. And the, this history was confronting Holocaust theology. So the, is, these Israeli historians, now, Palestinian historians had written about this, but Jews didn't believe it, and others were saying, well, they're exaggerating. But now these are Jewish Israeli historians who are researching in the Israeli archives, mostly. And they're discovering that what Palestinians said about their displacement, about their suffering, about them being murdered and raped was true. But Holocaust theology had no place for this. And the, litur the Jewish liturgy of destruction had no place for it. Remember, in the first quote that you, you talk about, and this is also happening, Jews watching this and often involved in the fighting, these are Jews who want a, a Jewish state, are recalling memories of Jewish suffering in the suffering that they are observing Jews are causing. This is the great reversal. Jews are thinking in terms of Jewish history. So when you see people being exiled, it's natural for Jews to think of Jews being exiled. But there's a difference. Jews are causing this exile. So in this new Israeli historians, they're surfacing diaries and comments by sometimes leaders of what became the Jewish state saying, what are we doing? We are doing what was done to us. Now, these again are Jews 
who want a Jewish state. These are not anti-Zionists. Yeah. They're not non-Jews. How do you, re you know, when we come from a history, we think in our own history and they're observing what's happening to Palestinian Arabs and thinking Jewishly. Oh, the great reversal. We're doing the liturgy of destruction. We're destroying as we were destroyed. So again, this also isn't theoretical. They're actually writing this and I'm discovering it in Jewish Israeli historical writing and simply applying it. The inclusive liturgy of destruction is actually already there, but the Jewish liturgy of destruction is trying to bar its entry as any orthodoxy tries to bar the history that is being created. This was mind blowing for me because although it seems obvious, well, it's so obvious. When I first saw it, I thought these are Jews thinking in our, within our historical memory of what we're now doing to others. This makes perfect sense. But Jews who don't want that memory and that current reality to be joined are going to fight about it, fight against it. Like Roski's, who basically told me that I was desecrating Jewish history by including Palestinians. Well, does he think they deserve it? No, they're not uh, available to him. They're not of interest to him. No, he wouldn't say they deserve it, except if they fight Jewish Israelis. Now, you then have this whole question about when is resistance to Jewish power allowed since we often resisted people's power over against us, don't they have the same right to resist us? Well, that is if we are doing something wrong, but if you believe that what we're doing is right and they're trying to undo our right, well, then they have no right to it. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, yeah, uh, my own discussions with them insofar as they would talk to me and on this trip, many of them would not talk to me because of my perspectives, which were within Jewish history. I wasn't bringing something outside of Jewish history. I was writing what was already inside. That's the most dangerous. This is much more dangerous than Chomsky. We've gone through this, the icon, and deservedly so, about American power. This was within Jews who wanted a Jewish state and who may have participated, often did participate in this oppression, thinking, what in God's name are we doing? We're doing the same thing that happened to us. Okay. Uh, now, uh, let me pause that. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, let me continue with the, uh, with the stories, really very disturbing stories for me. And, uh, um, and, and this one is a, uh, an account of, um, Uh, this this one is a, an account of uh, um, uh, this this one is an account from Amos Kenan or Cannon uh, 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 in an article of the Nation uh, written in February 1989. Four decades of blood vengeance, and he was talking about this is a his dialogue with George Habash, the head of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. 
whom he met in 1948 when the Israeli army conquered Lida. Okay, so uh, he, I, I will read this, uh, what he uh, written in that uh, article. In the afternoon, those of us, uh, because uh, um, uh, Canon was as part of this uh, uh, occupation of this uh, village of Lida. So he said, uh, in the afternoon, those of us who couldn't take it anymore would steal off to Tel Aviv for a few hours on one excuse or another. At night, those of us who couldn't restrain ourselves would go into the prison compounds to fuck Arab women. I want very much to assume, and perhaps even can, that those who couldn't restrain themselves did what they thought the Arabs would have done to them had they won the war. Once, only once, did an Arab woman, perhaps a distant relative of George Habash, dare to complain. There was a court martial. The complainant didn't even get to testify. The accused who was sitting behind the judges ran the back of his hand across his throat as a signal to the woman. She understood. The rapist was not acquitted. He simply was not accused because there was no one who would dare accuse him. Two years later, he was killed while plowing the fields of an Arab village. One no longer on the map because its inhabitants scattered and left it empty. Cannon then begins to write about the blood vengeance and how difficult it is to square accounts. Um, and he said, he continued, both you and I, George, have already taken vengeance before and during and after the fact. And both of you and I, both, and both you and I have not taken pity on man or woman, boy or girl, young or old. I know that there is not much difference between pressing a button in a fighter plane and firing point blank into the head of a hostage. As there is no difference between a great massacre that was not meant to be and one that was meant to be. There is no distinction between justice and justice or between injustice and injustice, as there is no difference at all in what people, weak, transient beings, assured of the justice of their ways and their deeds are capable of doing to people who are in some exactly like themselves. Tears filled my eyes, George, when I read for the first time in these 40 years how your sister died, how you dug her a pit with your own hands in the yard of her house in the city of Lida. I reach out with an unclean hand to your hand, which is also is not clean. You and I should die a miserable natural death, a death of sinners who have not come to their punishment, a death from old age, disease, a death weak and unheroic, a death meant for human beings who have lived in the life of iniquity. So yes, this, is I very, uh, this is very disturbing and haunting, uh, this uh, account of, you know, now those two people, Jewish and Palestinians, are now uh, uh, caught in this uh, situation where it's impossible not to, not to be uh, innocent. Right. You know, I remember reading that article in The Nation as I was writing this book. Again, all of this is happening while I'm writing. And I had an appointment, uh, a luncheon date with the rabbi, my uh, rabbi who was a non-Zionist, Rabbi Michael Robinson, uh, older than I was and no longer alive, quite a character. Uh, and I brought that article with me and it was a winter day, so I had it in my jacket pocket because I wanted to talk to him about it. I didn't know whether he would believe it. So I started telling him about this passage. I did now feel the apology, even, that the Israeli military wasn't like other militaries. And for the creation of the state of Israel, wasn't like 
others who fought for the creation of a state, that we were different. Again, all of this is different because we had experienced suffering and destruction. So we wouldn't cause suffering or destruction. And here, uh, here again, another Jewish Israeli confessing. He wanted a state. He wants a Jewish state. But he also confessed what he and others did. So that's one part, crushing for many American Jews and some Israeli Jews, although Israeli Jews had participated in this, so they knew a lot of it. And Holocaust theologians never mention any of it, ever. As I told you, Rabbi Greenberg asked me at Mary Knoll, was it true what I was saying that Jews in Israel were torturing Palestinians. He didn't say I was lying. The State Department at that time had verified it. Israeli groups, obviously Palestinians, Israeli human rights. He didn't deny it, but he, ever, no, he never spoke about it or wrote about it. He didn't deny it. He couldn't take it in and continue on. So the second part of it is that Keenan is realizing that we now have a history that's connected. This was also part of the Palestinian uprising and in a sense, the Jewish uprising within the Palestinian uprising. This is within Israel saying, look, I know what we did because I did it. You've done your things too as resistance to try to get back for what we did to you. Okay, our history is intertwined. We cannot be separated anymore. We've lived miserable lives. It's very, very vivid. What are we going to do about it? Let's admit it to each other. Let's get on with it. So that's another part of the Palestinian uprising. There were Jews, more than a few, who said, you know what? I hear you. What can we do now? We can never have the liturgy of destruction as if it only happened to Jews ever again. That's, so this, this article in The Nation, so powerful, I remember it so vividly, 30 years plus, as I'm writing, these are stories are coming from Jewish Israelis about what we did. And then we go back to Benny Morris and they're, they're outlining, he and other Jewish Israeli historians of what happened that we have displaced the people, we have murdered the people, we have stolen their land, we have stolen their goods, we've raped them. Don't deny it. This is the truth of it. And it's mostly in the Israeli archives. Yeah. Yeah. For most Jews in the United States, this is all propaganda. They're lying because Jews don't do these things. But Jews did and do these things. What are we going to do with? It? So, so that myth of you know, as uh, Shahak uh, would say, that that myth was uh, very strong uh, in, in in the sense of uh, uh, reinforcing that idea of uh, innocence. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have two more stories, um, Professor Ellis. Um, Please bear with me. I know this is relieving the trauma. Uh, I, and now we, we, get, we are now, uh, we, ha we now have a shared trauma <laughs> uh, from uh, uh, re you relieving this and me reading this for the first time. Okay, and these are the two stories that connect the experience of the uh, Palestinians with that of the Holocaust. And uh, for example, this story of the night of the broken clubs, this is the title of uh, a story um, by Yossi Sarid. And, and uh, I, uh, I, I'll read the entire uh, quote in the book, from the book. Okay. Uh, these are two other uh, Palestinian, two, uh, two others. These are stories from the Palestinian uprising that makes the connection of Palestinian and Jewish history in relation to the Holocaust. The first, uh, uh, 
dates from January 1998, one month after Palestinian uprising had begun, when an Israeli captain was summoned to his superior, the captain was given instruction to carry out arrest in the village of Hawara outside Nablus. The arrest of innocent young Palestinians is hardly out of the ordinary, but the further instruction provided to the officer was what to do to those Palestinians after the unrest was disturbing. And this is the account. The soldiers shackled the villagers and with their hands bound behind their backs, they were led to the bus. The bus started to move and after 200 to 300 meters, it stopped beside an orchard. The locals were taken off the bus and led into the orchard in groups of three, one after another. Every group was accompanied by an officer. In the darkness of the orchard, the soldiers also shackled the Hawara residents legs and laid them on the ground. The officers urged the soldiers to get it over with quickly so that we can leave and forget about it. Then flannel was stuffed into the Arabs' mouths to prevent them from screaming and the bus driver revved up the motor so that the noise would drown out the cries. Then the soldiers obediently carried out the orders they had been given to break their arms and legs by clubbing the Arabs, to avoid clubbing them on their heads, to remove their bonds after breaking their arms and legs, and to leave them at the site, to leave one local with broken arms but without broken legs so he could make it back to the village on his own and get help. So this, uh, this uh, very disturbing story uh, give, uh, connects it to the uh, to the night of the uh, glasses, the broken glasses. Uh, am I right? Uh, and yes. now, I, can you tell the connection? Because I'm not really. Yeah, I, I remember it, it's called the night of the broken glasses, uh, Crystal Knock. Uh, yes. And uh, yes. Uh, this was again. This is recalling in symbolic language the Jewish liturgy of destruction, and that was in Germany. Uh, a very important moment when um, the rampages against Jews was accelerating, where glass was shattered and synagogues were put on fire and all. And then after that, uh, because that was also dangerous for the social order for Germans who were not Jews, there became a more methodical uh, uh, treating of the Jewish question or problem in Germany. It was the beginning of the end of German Jewry and the beginning of the Holocaust itself. It separated the early Nazi period, which discriminated against Jews big time, but now there was an acceleration. But the point of this is he didn't say broken clubs or this is a terrible event. He called it the night of the broken clubs. So He's playing, a very prominent Israeli, by the way, again, Jewish Israeli, is playing on this image, the night of shattered glass, this Nazi image. And again, this is forbidden in Holocaust theology. How dare you? But Jews naturally are thinking in relation to our own history. And I remember reading that, and I still, uh, yeah, again, people can say, how naive were you, Mark? And the answer is very and uh, how naive were Jews, Mark? Very. And I took that story, not only wrote it in Beyond Innocence and Redemption, but I spoke around the world and in universities in the United States and in Jerusalem using these stories. I spoke it out loud. And even when you read it, I hear it within me. This is a very, these stories are part now of our liturgy of destruction and it's a liturgical story in the sense that it recalls an event, like the events that the Liturgy of Destruction recalls for Jews. Now Jews are the perpetrators and it's methodical, atrocity as a method. Uh, you know, They didn't say kill them, although some Palestinians were killed. And they didn't say break all their legs and just leave them, but leave one to go back to his village to warn others. So 
uh, and then the, the, the engine, uh, the, the bus and stuff, this recalling again, Nazi attempts to camouflage what was happening. So this is a Nazi-like story told by a Jewish Israeli who is a Zionist and a state Zionist, not an anti-Zionist, not a homeland Zionist, and is recognizing in what he is part of as Nazi-like. And again, this Nazi analogy, it's not saying this is the Holocaust. This is naturally how people think. It's, it's, it's as African-Americans would think in their history when they see something in the present, or women would think in their history as they see something in the present. This is a natural way, but forbidden. How dare you? Yet that's happening. And I'm receiving these mimeographed translations of stories in the Israeli press, not the Arab press, not at the Chinese press, not the Soviet press, the Israeli press written not by Palestinians, not by Russians, not by Chinese, not, not by Muslims, by Jews. A deep imprint and it becomes as deep within me as our suffering and then people would say, well, that's wrong. Their suffering can't be imprinted within you, like Jewish suffering. Yes, it can. And it's shattering. Yeah. Now, we have to differentiate. It's more shattering for Palestinians. I understand this, and there's been critique of Jews being so anguished about what Jews are doing, we forget Palestinians. But I'm recalling now Jewish history and my community and my history. Yeah, and, and to think uh, for uh, Palestinians that uh, this history is being erased. Uh, uh, also for Jews and, to meet, like traveling, as I told you, this wasn't an armchair theology. During this time, I was traveling around the world, but I was also traveling to Israel, Palestine, multiple times in 88, in 89, in 90, maybe 10 times and spending time and speaking there and meeting people who this happened to. You know, this wasn't, I wasn't just reading about it. I was meeting people that this had happened to or would happen to Palestinians. And there we are as a Jew, not theorizing about what Jews might do if we had power, but encountering people who we were using power against. Yeah. So this so, is yeah, very. You, you mentioned this uh, uh, last time that you know, as you were writing this, you were also uh, going uh, to uh, uh, Palestine, Israel, Palestine, and really meeting all, all of this, uh, all of the uh, people. Sure, I was meeting the, the, the Palestinian uprising had a quote secret leadership, so you didn't ask. There were many people involved, but I was meeting all of them. Uh, and I was also going to villages and I was seeing, I, I, I went to the hospitals where Palestinians had been shot, these young kids who were brain dead. I was in the hospitals seeing them and I was going to their bedside and seeing their parents. This was not for me reading about it. I was reading about it. I was also experiencing it. Now here's an American Jew quite Jewish, traveling Jewish, and meeting Palestinians who had been abused. Okay, dislocated in 48 for sure. And young Palestinians in the West Bank and Jerusalem and Gaza who had been shot by Israeli soldiers and who were brain dead in hospitals. I was in those hospitals. I was visiting them. What could I say? Hi, how are you? I'm so sorry excuse me, I'm not part of this. So how did you, how did you respond? Uh, I when responded. You, when, you, when you met the, uh, this uh, family, so uh, children. Well, what do you, what do you just say to a Palestinian family in a hospital who's at the bedside of their 18 year old son who's brain dead, shot by an Israeli 
and you have Palestinian flags, yeah. kafias uh, around the, the bedside. What what do you say? I, I would be very, you know, I would probably be silent. So humiliated uh, by this. Uh, well, I was basically silent, but they wanted me to speak too, because this is another part of it, which was also very difficult. I didn't want to say anything. I had nothing to say. That's number one. But I was also already known as a writer and uh, as someone speaking about this, and therefore they wanted the word to go out. This was so crucial. And I was, they exaggerated my ability to change things because they needed to exaggerate it. So that was another thing. I was powerless, but they wanted me to have power because they were recognizing that not all Jews wanted this. Not all Jews had seen this. And they thought if Jews knew more about it and Americans knew more about it, we would stop. And they were wrong. And I knew they were wrong, but I couldn't tell them that. I was a sign of hope for them, but that made it more difficult for me because I knew I wasn't in their lifetime. So their suffering is number one, but I'm telling you my story. These stories were devastating, but I was experiencing them and I couldn't put them aside and I couldn't say, well, maybe they're exaggerating. This wasn't exaggeration. This was a truth that I was experiencing. What to do with it, all I could do was speak it and write it, but I had no power. And that was also something that was so difficult for me in meeting these parents and these children that they thought I could do something because they needed that assurance that it could be done. But I couldn't, really. And we couldn't. It wasn't going to end. And talking to the doctors who didn't have even the supplies to treat. That, that, yeah, when you went into these hospitals, as I did, uh, it was devastating. Yeah, I can, I can, uh, it's difficult to imagine. Uh, but uh, I, it's, it's, as you said, it's devastating. Um, Yes, and uh, one more story, uh, Professor Ellis. And this would be the last. Um, and this one is a, a, a story uh, uh, by uh, Marcus Levy. I was a physician, and this is uh, the, uh, the article was. Uh, this was about an incident, and the article uh, was entitled "You Will Get Used to Being a Mangala." So the second story uh, occurred just months after the beatings had begun, when Marcus Levine, a physician, was called up for sir duty in the Answer to Prison Camp. When he arrived, Levin met two of his colleagues and asked for information about his duties. The answer, mainly you examine prisoners before and after an investigation. Levin responded in amazement. After the investigation, which prompted the reply, nothing special, sometimes there are fractures. For instance, yesterday they brought a 12 year old boy with two broken legs. Dr. Levin, then demanded a meeting with the compound commander and told him, my name is Marcus Levine and not Joseph Mangale. And for reasons of conscience, I refuse to serve in this place. A doctor was, uh, was present at the meeting, tried to calm Levine with the following comment. Marcus, first you feel like Mangala, but after a few days, you get used to it. Yeah, I, I, those, you know, those words uh, resonate within me. I, I hear them often inside me, even today. Uh, devastating. 
part of the inclusive liturgy of destruction. Levin is, is, is resisting. Now, we don't know if he resisted forever or not. I don't know. I don't know whether he's still in Israel, whether he's still alive, or whether he left Israel. I don't know what he did during this time after this. This is in the Israeli press. But there again, he's thinking in terms of the Jewish liturgy of destruction. My name is Marcus Levin, not Joseph Mengele. And, and then the after a while, at first you feel like that. Yeah. After a while, you get used to it. Yeah, that, that is... <laughs> I am also disturbed by that, the comment from the doctor who said, you know, you'll get used to it. Well, that's true for many in many circumstances around the world, isn't it? But when I first read that, and I, I can remember the mimeograph sheet, uh, I can remember looking at it, and I have recited it so often around the world. It's inside me. And I think the speaking for me was a liturgy of destruction, too. If you look at my speeches, which are in the archives at that time during 88, 89, 90 and beyond. It's really the inclusive liturgy of destruction. This book is an inclusive liturgy of destruction. And uh, it's liturgical. These, you know. I wrote a book later on Holy Alliance, Religion and Atrocity in Our Time. And I talked about the historical gospels, the gospel of 1492, uh, the gospel of colonialism, the gospel of Treblinka, the gospel of Auschwitz, and how these gospels are the historical gospels of Christianity, but they're not in the liturgy, are they? But they have to be, each time you have the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of Luke or the Gospel, yeah, you need to also have these historical Gospels. That would fill it out. And then you could think, well, these Gospels, these Gospels, they're all part of our history. Then you could figure out what does it mean to be Catholic now? But these stories are part of our, I call about the, the, book, of, uh, the book of Palestine. I started writing late at another time. We have the book, the Exodus. We have different books in the Hebrew, in the Torah. Now we have the book of Palestine. And this, these two stories and more would be in it. They would be written from the perspective of the victim of Jewish power. And it would include Palestinians speaking for themselves, but also these Jews like Marcus Levine. It would include his story we would get a fuller sense of what it means to be Jewish, which now includes resistance and destruction, not just our destruction and not just the destruction of Palestinians, but our resistance to destruction. I am Marcus Levin, not Joseph Mengele. After a while, you get used to it. This is very important to recite over and over and over again. If you want to have a Holocaust theology, recite these stories too. The inclusive liturgy of destruction beyond innocence and redemption is an inclusive liturgy of destruction as I narrated it during the Palestinian uprising. That's uh, in, indeed. That's uh, that's how it is. It should be read, uh, Professor Ellis. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, I, as I was uh, reading all of these stories, it's just it makes me sick in my stomach. Uh, it's uh, um, and, and I guess these. Uh, that's why it's so. That's why this inclusive liturgy of destruction is very controversial and also you know it's, it's so um it's almost a, it's, it's like a voice in the wilderness because you know it's it uh, the consequence of heeding to this inclusivity is uh, it's really what would be left i think that's the question what would remain if it's uh 
Well, the thing is, is that it exists and that Jews don't know the particulars in general, but they know in general. So it exists. It's not a question of what would we do with it if it exists? What will we do with it in its existence? And for most Jews, you shut it down and the Jewish establishment shuts it down and Holocaust theology shut it down, mm -hmm. but it still exists like the suffering of those who suffered from Catholic imperialism. You can say it doesn't, it exists. So, and then there's everyone, you know, who wants to keep it from existing as if by saying it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. But yes, it, and again, the victims of our power, whether it's Jewish or otherwise, are never worthy of inclusion in our history, is it? They're never worthy in our view, because if they're worthy, we would have to change. Yeah. And then that is the, uh, the challenge. Okay, Professor Ellis. So uh, that's actually the first half. And, uh, the, the, and then you uh, mentioned uh, other uh, Israeli uh, Jews who have, uh, you know, basically you were criticizing how could they would, how, how can they write stuff uh, that uh, uh, where the, the Palestinians are totally absent from their writings. For example, you mentioned about David Hartman and Michael Wishagod, uh, who Wish are published, Wishagod, Wishagrod. Uh, who uh, published full-length monographs on the present and future of Jewish belief without mentioning Palestinians. Oh, and yeah. then well, there you also have, you know, even Wiesel's and Greenberg's uh, uh, writings. Uh, just basically, uh, uh, their silence about uh, uh, the, what's happening to the Palestinian people. Oppressive Jews and Jewish renewal in general much of it, not all of it, is silent about Palestinians because Jews don't know what to do. First of all, Palestinians aren't worthy of our inclusion. That's, you know, why even talk about them? And is it actually true what you're saying? And what do we do if it is, if they are worthy and if it is true? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the whole biblical renewal, uh, and I remember being on one of these serve, uh, list and uh, getting it. And I raised a question and a very nice progressive Jewish academic said, Mark, we don't discuss Israel or Palestine. And I'm saying, oh, so that became quite normative in the 90s and into 2000. And now uh, where there, it's just both the Palestinians are avoided, but also Israel's avoided because Israel is too controversial. So a lot of those Jews have simply said, we don't want any of that. So they're not even on the Israel bandwagon. Mm -hmm. They want to keep all of it out because it's too disturbing. And even Lerner and Tikkun until very recently and still really, so, they want to build. They they want to build a wall between Israel, Jews, and Palestinians, so we never have to see them again. If you look at Tikkun very precisely, the text in especially Lerner's editorials, he wants to reclaim Jewish innocence. This is a very important point. Maybe we'll close on this. There are Jews who say, "Yeah, what we're doing to Palestinians is wrong, and they deserve a state." So give them a state and we can go back to our innocence. Something happened, there was an aberration and we did some things wrong, but that's not the way we are. We'll go back and we'll build a wall between us. They can have their freedom, but we can be free of them because it's too disturbing, the image of what we've done, the reality. So a lot of Jewish progressive thought that broke with Hol Holocaust theology and who recognized Palestinian rights to some extent, 
also wanted to be separated from them. I'm making a different point. After you oppress another people, there's no separation. We can only move forward together. You can't erase what we did. And liturgies tend to erase what we did, whether it's Catholic, Jewish, Islamic, Hindu, right? I'm calling for a liturgy, which may not be possible, that doesn't erase. Okay. Uh, let me see if I still have one more as a, as a closing. Uh, Okay, so uh, this is the uh, last point for this uh, uh, conversation, and uh, and of course we're just we're just in the first half of the chapter. You you talk about the tension between the prophetic and normalization. Uh, again, uh, uh, you have been you have been uh, uh, talking about this. Um, as some, some Jews were seeing the Palestinian people, their own history, and observing that history in, in sad and profound ways, they were recognizing that the history of Jews and Palestinians is somehow in the expulsions and massacres bound together. Which is what is your proposal for an inclusive liturgy of destruction. But it's also clear that the ability to see this bond is intimately related to the ability to admit that Jews are no longer innocent. And this is precisely the most, most controversial issue. And as you said, uh, that's why nobody wants to take this uh, liturgy uh, seriously, because uh, it might mean the end of uh, liturgy uh, as we know it. Yeah, that's the, that's the challenge. All liturgy tries to cover over history. That's its job. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we don't know what we would do if the historical gospels were admitted in the Catholic liturgy. You have the beautiful Jesus going out and healing this one. And then you have uh, Christians coming to the Philippines and conquering the Philippines or in Latin America. What, what do you do with that? How do you affirm that history? Well, if you don't affirm the complexities of your own history, are you affirming it? Or are you denying it? Well, th there's a lot of uh, yes, I, I, I understand what you're saying about uh, you no know, the uh, the the tendency to separate uh, because the the claim that, for example, you know the the, the text the, like the gospel text has assumed a uh, a kind of a sacredness. You know, it, it's it's uh, the word of God, and and so to. Uh, connect that with a historical uh, event uh, it seems uh, um, yeah there's a, a disconnect in, in that they don't see the continuation between the gospels and what the uh, uh, friars or the missionaries uh, have done uh, to the uh, indigenous peoples uh, you know they maybe, have maybe there maybe there isn't a connection there isn't Maybe there isn't a connection. That's the difficult point, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, of course, it's, it's impossible. But are we going to carry on? Are you going to allow uh, the Catholic mass to go on and not be uh, thinking about what's really happening? And there are many Catholics who do think about that now, or Protestants or Hindus or Muslims and Jews. How are we going to think maybe together about what we do with what's left of our traditions once we include the victims of our tradition, including the internal victims? Yeah, it's difficult. Too bad when you oppress others, it comes back to haunt you. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the point. Uh... Everyone is entangled in, in justice. Um, yeah, uh, there's no uh, pristine tradition that we could, uh, there's no purity in our uh, tradition. And I think that, that, that's a, a very difficult thing to accept. Okay, so uh, 
Thank you uh, so much, Professor Ellis. And, uh, you know, again, I apologize for <laughs> uh, relieving this trauma. Uh, and, and now I, I am sharing that trauma uh, from uh, this, uh, the reading of this uh, uh, liturgy of destruction. And uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's uh, how do we move forward? That's the, that's the question. Uh, toward an inclusive liturgy of destruction, or is it, uh, you know, there's really no way going forward? Well, thank you. Uh, and it is uh, bringing me back to these days, which is important, and that they re be remembered. And this will help it in a small way to be remembered by others, as I experienced it. Uh, but it is a traumatic re-experience for me but it also reminds me of my journey and the journey of others, other Jews, that continues today with the understanding that we as Jews are not innocent. 